biggest question, the first question that comes to my mind is, what made you want to get into this and take on an incumbent, uh, somebody with uh, Mr. Sorrell's you know, background and history? And could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Happy to be in Bennington. It's here uh, Saturday uh, most of the day and uh, happy to be back. You know, I'm running because I think after 15 years it's time for a change in the Attorney General's office. I think it's time for new ideas, new engagement, and new energy in the Attorney General's office. We know that the world has changed. We know that Vermont has changed the last 15 years. We know that particularly in the last four years, given the economic recession, everybody in the state, in the state is being forced to work harder, to do things differently, to be innovative, to be creative, to be more collaborative. The Attorney General's office should too. Some of the issues that I think distinguish me from my opponent are these. Number one, I think the number one public safety issue in this state and public health issue is prescription drug abuse. I have a plan, I look forward to talking about it tonight. I think another significant issue of concern in this state that I wish to address is elder abuse. You know, Vermont has the seventh highest percentage per capita of senior citizens in the country. I've come out with a plan to create an elder abuse unit to combat that because it's estimated that 84% of elder abuse crimes go unreported because of the stigma attached to this. Oftentimes, the people committing the crime are loved ones or caretakers. Third, I think the issue of reforming the criminal justice system is an issue that has to be done, and it has to be done soon. In the last 15 years, the budgets, the corrections budget has gone up 175%. Vermont has jumped from fifth to second in the rate of incarceration, yet our recidivism rate is still 43% or 52%. The Attorney General is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of this state. Public safety is about prevention. Fourth, as a father of two young boys, my wife and I, we care about what we want to feed our kids. We think we have the right to know, as every other parent, what we put in our food. Those are some of the issues that I look forward to talking about. I think that, as I said, after 15 years, it is time for a change. It's time for new energy, it's time to be more creative, it's time to be more collaborative, it's time to be more innovative. That's what the folks are doing across the state. The Attorney General should do it too. Let me uh, just say that Dick Sears is here supporting you. <clears throat> and uh, Dick, if you'd like to say anything. The other thing I'd like to ask, are you picking up this for Cat TV? You got the part. And this mic that we're using is going to be for WBT. This mic <laughs> we're using is going to be for WBTN, so you can hear it uh, replayed on WBTN if they're convenient. Great. And thank you, Mike. Thank you for being down in Bennington, TJ. We really appreciate your joining us down here in the Forgotten Kingdom. Um, we, uh, we do feel left out a lot. And one of the things, one of the reasons I endorsed you is early on uh, when I began working on this issue of prescription drug abuse in the legislature as chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, backing up to last August when I met with a number of police officers here in Bennington about the growing gang uh, and prescription drug issues. So your interest in that and your work on the rapid arraignment program, if you could describe a little bit about what a rapid arraignment program sure. is and how we could have something like that for the rest of the state to identify uh, various offenders. Sure. Thank you, Senator. I am proud and honored to have the support Senator Dick Sears in this race. Uh, he's been a great leader on the issues of public safety, criminal justice reform, and addressing the issues of the corrections budget. You know, we have 14 different systems of justice in 14 different counties in this state. Uh, anybody who says otherwise, uh, frankly, is wrong. Uh, people can be treated one way in Bennington County. Uh, that similarly situated person in Chittenden County can be treated differently. Uh, this is an issue of fairness. This is an issue of consistency. That corrections budget of $140 million, uh, we do a good job, I think, in this state of putting people who truly pose the threat of public safety uh, in jail. People who murder, uh, men who rape, uh, those that uh, break into people's homes. We do a good job. Where we fail are on the issues of substance abuse, on the issues of mental illness. We know that those issues do not discriminate, but poverty does come from a family of resources, uh, you're going to have, it's more likely that you're going to have an intervention. For the poor, oftentimes, that intervention is the criminal justice system. 80% of women incarcerated in the state of Vermont receive mental health treatment. Uh, 
oftentimes they've been victimized themselves, haven't gotten the help they needed. It's gone on where they've started to self-medicate and have developed substance abuse issues as well as co-occurring mental health issues. And that drives the crime. Most women incarcerated in the state are in for property offenses, stealing oftentimes to feed uh, their addiction. So we created a program in Chittenden County uh, that basically was this. If our job is public safety, the question we have to ask ourselves, are we more safe if a person comes in for a third, fourth time and we're going to give them yet another conviction for retail theft? Here's our options. We can order them to pay a fine. They're not going to pay it. We can put them on probation and set conditions of probation that they're not going to satisfy. We can put them in jail, but they're going to get out of jail. Or we can try to address the root cause of the criminal behavior, that substance abuse issue, that mental health issue in the community. So the Rapid Intervention Community Court Program was this. Let's bring together all the social services. Let's bring together the, health, the people in health care. Let's bring together people in education because the people that we're serving in corrections are the people that are serving in the social service field. It's the people who are going to the ER to see their primary care doc. And these are the people where the overlap exists across our systems. We started to collaborate. We started to share information. We started to, thanks to Senator Sears, receive some funding uh, from the folks in Montpelier. And we, used, we started to use science. We now use evidence-based screening tools to assess risk and needs when people come into court. So, so instead of just filing a charge, being reactive, having that cost not only to the taxpayer, but to the individual through the criminal justice system, we're now assessing risk and needs before they go into court. Based on that, we're linking them with the appropriate social service agency in the community. If they successfully complete whatever the treatment plan is, we don't file the charge. Here's the results thus far. We have close to an 80% compliance rate. We're saving thousands and thousands of taxpayer dollars because keep in mind, it's $52,000 a year to incarcerate somebody in Vermont. So that meter doesn't start running. We've won national awards for this program. Governor Shumlin has said he wants to see this program in every county, in every courthouse in the state. There's only one person who can implement that. It's the Attorney General, because the Attorney General is the only person who has statewide jurisdiction across the state. This is about fairness. This is about opportunity. This is about leveling the playing field for all of ours. Let me follow up on that. So you're saying that if somebody does serve their sentence, then they go into this type of program, or they go in before they serve their sentence? Are they found guilty or innocent? Uh, this is all pre-charge. This is all pre-charge, meaning if uh, the best way to, uh, to explain it is somebody is arrested for a retail theft. These are low-level misdemeanor cases. Uh, they receive a citation from the police officer, told to show up in court. Paperwork, the case file has already come to the prosecutor's office. We've screened it. We've determined that this case is appropriate based on the charge. The charge we're looking for are those property offenses, the low level misdemeanors, nothing that's going to. A non violent. Non violent offense. <clears throat> when the person comes to court, we approach them. These are not first time offenders. These are people who've been through the criminal justice system two, three times, oftentimes more. Now, we say this you want to contest your charge? There's the courthouse doors, go right in. If you want help, are you willing to talk to us? We want to give you an opportunity to get help. Very few people pass up the opportunity to get help. We then conduct that risk assessment. Based on that, we link the person to the appropriate social service agency in the community for the treatment. Oftentimes it's substance abuse, oftentimes it's mental health. If there's a victim involved, bring in the reparative board, which is part of the restorative justice model of the community justice centers, so the victim is addressed. If there's compliance based on the treatment plan, we don't file a charge, because this is my belief. Our job as prosecutors, as law enforcement officials, is public safety. I think the best form of public safety is when we have sober, stable, gainfully employed people in our community. That is the best form of public safety. Second, we are going to save thousands and thousands of taxpayer dollars by not by doing this in a community-based a community way. We're creating infrastructure in the community. Far cheaper, more effective, 
than the correction system, $140 million, 150 bucks a day, $52,000 a year. This makes sense. We should implement this across the state. I'm going to do it as an attorney, as an attorney general. And do you know why we haven't implemented something like this? Why this hasn't been done over the last couple of years? Or? Well, I think really through the leadership of Senator Sears, um, there's been a great effort to get other prosecutors in the state. I know a state's attorney, uh, Erica Martha, just looking at this program. Uh, I, here's the thing. This is different. Uh, our public safety and criminal justice system has operated a certain way for a long time. Uh, arrest is made, you're brought into court, uh, there is a reaction from the prosecutor from the court, sentence, sentence is opposed. That system works for the very serious crimes. It doesn't work for, as I said, those issues uh, that are driven by drugs, alcohol, and mental health issues. Where I think we're gonna demonstrate that this truly works, that this enhances public safety, and that it needs to be a statewide approach is on two parts. Number one, that compliance rate and recidivism rate. That's the true measure. Secondly, you know, these last four years, as I said at the outset, have been difficult. Budgets have been cut. Uh, Senator Sears can tell you better than I uh, the effort, and Senator Sears deserves credit, among others, to really the leadership he's led on the Department of Corrections budget on uh, coming up with alternative justice systems in this state and uh, innovative programs. So that pressure has been there for a number of years now. Uh, I think that originally this came out of a program that I know Representative Alice Miller would, would uh, be familiar with, Challenges for Change. How do you make government more efficient and more effective, more cost effective? So these are the challenges, and I think that once we show that it enhances public safety through that recidivism rate, and secondly, it saves money, everybody should be doing this, but the person who's got the statewide jurisdiction to get it done is the Attorney General. Dick, let me ask you a question. Does the legislature need to approve this program once the Attorney General adopts it? Well, we would need to fund it. Uh, okay. That's, you know, that was the thing. And I, I wanted to liken it to a, a program that we developed based upon what was going on in Chittenden County and Franklin County. It was to deal with childhood sex abuse cases. It was called the Cousy Unit. Um, Bennington, uh, way, it was back in the, a few years ago, we were able to started statewide because we saw the effectiveness in one county and we were able to fund that. And Bennington has been a leader actually is one of the, uh, the best programs in the state now, our own uh, effort. And one of the things people say to me is, well, we've got a lot of sex offenders. Well, we've always had a lot of sex offenders. We're catching them now, which is, I think, the positive thing of these units and what they've done. But it takes a statewide effort and a statewide mind to get there. Now, we've still got some of the counties in the state that aren't doing very well with these sex offender units. And I, I was talking to some uh, a senator from Rutland who was very concerned about what was going on in Rutland County with their unit. So in order to get these things statewide, we need the cooperation of not only the Attorney General, the legislature for funding, but we also need to have a buy-in from the various state's attorneys. And I know that a number of state's attorneys have come out and supported TJ. I think it's because of that effort, and it's quite frankly one of the reasons I'm supporting him. But yes, it will need statewide funding, but we need leadership. Well, it seems like if we don't do something like this, you're going to keep going around and around in circles and putting them in, taking them off, and you're not, you're not, you're not able to help these people get rehabilitated because, like you said, they're going to be back out on the street. If I could uh, just. Uh, this is blowing my own horn a little bit, but uh, if I don't, nobody else will, right? <laughs> we don't even like this. <laughs> when we started the war on recidivism uh, back several years ago in the Senate Judiciary Committee, quite frankly, um, we needed leadership to help us move that forward. And when I met with state's attorneys who understood the issues, and that's part of how we got to the rapid arraignment, it's part of how we got to other things, what we did. Um, but the idea of the war on recidivism is we take half of the money we save in 
the corrections budget and reinvestment invested in community programs. And that money can be reinvested into housing for offenders, can be reinvested into programs like the rapid intervention program. Um, not every county is exactly the same, but they ought to have the same opportunities. And I think that's where one of the reasons that I'm supporting TJ and one of the reasons I hope others will as well. Uh, another question that I have is uh, what will you do differently than uh, uh, Attorney General Sorrell on the Yankee of closing and before closing that? Are you, uh, are you going to be able to continue what he's trying to do? I guess he's going to feel it. I'm not sure that you're going to follow through. Really well, the case is currently under appeal, and I think Vermont Yankee should be shut out. I think the difference I had with Attorney General Sorrell, not only on Vermont Yankee, uh, on data mining, uh, on campaign finance, and what's going to be health care, when health care is passed, we're going to get challenged in health care uh, as well. All these issues are constitutional issues. They're complex, but complicated. Very few lawyers practice constitutional law. Even fewer lawyers argue at the level of the United States Supreme Court. It is a select practice. So I think what we have to do is this. We can't be penny wise and pound foolish. We gotta invest early, bring the experts in, and let's get it right, let's work with the legislature, let's ask the tough questions, and when that bill is signed into law, let's make sure it stands up in the court of law. And that's good government. Uh, as I said, we, the, the number, we just paid out close to $4.2 million in legal fees for losing the case. By investing wisely, by bringing in the experts early, I think we can do better. Uh, asking for help is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of leadership. The other thing I was disappointed in, in the current Attorney General is when he got into the, I, I don't remember all the details, but he got into trying to tell us about something about soda, how much so you could drink or whatever. And I, I thought it was a joke at first. You're going to make a promise that you're not going to get into trivial things like that, right? Tell, tell, tell me you're going to make a promise about that. Uh, I, I can promise you this. I will not be proposing any soda taxes. Okay. Um, but here's why. Here's why I oppose a soda tax. It's a tax on the poor. Soda's cheap and it's accessible. It's a tax on the poor. And I think that's, a, again, a fundamental uh, the difference between uh, my opponent and I, whether it's these issues that drive crime, mental illness, substance abuse, whether it's an issue of understanding poverty and understanding how difficult getting out of poverty is. Uh, these are, these issues are all connected and you have to take, I think, a wide perspective on these issues and understand that what we truly need to do is give people an opportunity to be successful. I gotta say, Great, great progress was made by the state under the leadership of Dick Sears on the issue of the right of expungement. For me, the criminal justice system. Why don't you explain that to people? Why you listening? Yeah. When we, when people talk about anti-poverty work, it starts with reforming the criminal justice system because certain convictions carry what are called collateral consequences. You lose your right on some convictions to your eligibility for federal student loans. You lose your right to public housing. You lose your right uh, to food stamps. And it's difficult to get a job. And as a prosecutor, I get letters weekly from folks asking to have their old criminal convictions, oftentimes misdemeanors, expunged because they can't get a job. And this issue of the right of expungement was not an issue about being soft on crime not an issue of giving amnesty. It was a jobs issue. And under the leadership of Dick Sears, uh, this just got passed this, pa this past session. This is good public policy. This is good policy that is going to enhance our collective public safety by giving people an opportunity to get back to work. Because when you take away somebody's ability to work, to provide for themselves, to provide for their family, it it's no secret they're going to continue to be marginalized and find their way into the criminal justice system. So, Senator Sears, thank you for that. Thank you, TJ. And just to be clear about it, though, when we were working on S-38, which was the expungement bill, um, we had the support of two states' attorneys, TJ Donovan and Eric Manovich. 
And I think the reason that we have that support is they clearly, there may have been one of those also, but I want to mention those two. Because it was clear to them, they get calls from people saying, I couldn't even accompany my grandchildren on a field trip because of a marijuana conviction 25 years ago. It's still on my record, a small amount. Um, when people come to you with those stories, and obviously they're not going to the, to the governor and say, give me a pardon on that. This sets up a process that folks can go to their state's attorney or to the court in their district wherever they were convicted. And after 10 years, and if they've stayed out of trouble and so forth, uh, to try to get their record expunged on misdemeanors, nonviolent misdemeanor uh, counts. Um, we're going to see how this works. But it's surprising the number of people that are affected by dumb things they did when they were 19 or 20. Okay, I'm, I'm glad I didn't do anything. <laughs> no, me too. Young and stupid. <laughs> but I uh, know I have some of those people calling me to yeah. ask me to. So I, I think uh, when you have these types of issues, we call in various folks to talk, and we always call in the state's attorneys or the uh, public defender always gets the voice. And we call them the usual suspects. But it was uh, nice on this issue. That normally, we wouldn't expect the support from the basics from the state's attorneys. Um, but we did get an expungement. I'm very appreciative of that the support from Eric and TJ and others. Well, it, 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 when I heard you were going to run in the primary, I said, you've got to get him down here and uh, Mr. Sorrell, because not too many people will take on an incumbent you know, in a primary, whether a Democrat or Republican. So uh, you got to have a uh, credit for that, but uh, how much support do you think you have? What gave you the, the courage to just do this, take on a, a popular uh, attorney general? This question gets too tough, I think. I've been accused of not being the brightest bulb. <laughs> um, you know, my, uh, in this regard, you know, my wife said to me, she said, this is either really brave or really stupid. <laughs> you know, I, I gotta tell you, uh, it goes back to being uh, a county elected official uh, during these last three, four years uh, where budgets have been cut, uh, people have lost jobs, people have been on pay cuts, and we've all been asked uh, to get into a room county office holders, the state police, uh, the sheriffs, and come up with innovative, creative ways of reforming our criminal justice system to save money and make it more effective. And the person that was missing was the attorney general. I feel very strongly that no job, no elected position in this state belongs to any particular person. It belongs to the people of the state of Vermont. They deserve a choice. This is an office that there hasn't been a change in 15 years. The world has changed. It is time to have a debate about the issues and what we can do differently, and in my opinion, what we can do better. Uh, debate is good. Debate is about democracy. Uh, this is uh, a race that has uh, I think uh, is going to be close. Uh, I've received, received a lot of support, uh, not only from Senator Sears, uh, Representative Bill Lipper, who is the chair of the House Judiciary C uh, Committee, has endorsed my candidacy. I've been endorsed by the state police. I've been endorsed by the Sheriff's Association. I've been endorsed by the Vermont State Employees, uh, AFL-CIO, uh, the building trades, the firefighters. People want engagement. People want change. People want new ideas. Uh, it's not to say uh, that the incumbent has done anything wrong. It's what we can do differently and what we can do better. And it's an acknowledgement that the world is changing. We're all in this together. And we have to work together to improve the lives of our honors. Hey, you don't have anybody running against you in a primary, do you? I've <laughs> been there, done that. <laughs> I, uh, no, I don't. Um, but uh, Good thing he is running against you. Well, uh, shocked me a long ago if I was running for anything above the state senate. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about uh, a different issue, and that's campaign finance. Um, a lot of us put together the, the law in Vermont, um, and right now, it isn't clear to me as a candidate how much I can raise. It isn't clear to me what my responsibilities are. Um, because of the Supreme Court ruling, and I, and I understand that the Attorney General just said, we're not going to prosecute any PACs in Vermont. They can spend whatever they want. 
Uh, do you have any thoughts on campaign finance? I do. We sorely need it. Uh, there's way too much money in politics, uh, certainly at a national level, and even in Vermont, there's too much money. Uh, I think the recent decision by the Attorney General to say that super PACs uh, are allowed in this state uh, based on a court ruling, he declared that a victory. That is not a victory by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and this is the issue getting back to the United States Supreme Court. When we lose at that level, or when the other side wins, it sets precedent and it sets dangerous precedent, in my mind, in terms of campaign finance. Look no further than the decision in Citizens United. From that decision at the, the Supreme, Supreme Court level in Citizens United, uh, we get to allowing super PACs here in the law. So what can we do on this issue? On Citizens United, there's not much we can do. Uh, where the fight is on campaign finance is on disclosures now. It's making people who are trying to influence politicians, trying to influence policy, disclose where the money is coming from so the voter is fully informed about who's attempting to influence political elections. And that's really where this effort's going to be in terms of campaign finance, is on the issue of disclosure. Thank you. Is there a, uh, is there a connection between the Vermont case and the Citizens United? You know, I don't, I, I don't think it would be fair to say there's uh, a connection. Um, the Vermont case is not cited in the uh, Citizens United case. Um, I think as we look at the makeup of the court, I think this reinforces my argument about bringing in the experts early on these constitutional cases. Uh, I think a, a, a good example is going to be health care. Uh, when something is passed in health care, we know it will be challenged. I think everybody can acknowledge that, given just the tone of the, the debate uh, in Washington, uh, and certainly even in Vermont on this issue. So when this bill is being crafted, I'm Attorney General, again, let's be smart. Let's bring in these experts early to work with the legislature, to advise it. And when, and it's not to say let's replace legislative counsel, but when Vermont gets sued, it's not legislative counsel who defends the state of Vermont. It's the Attorney General. So I think it's wise to bring in these experts because this is a slight practice. It's highly complicated. The attorney for Entergy Louisiana, Kathleen Sullivan, was up for consideration for a seat on the United States Supreme Court. And this is the level of attorneys that we're going against. It's not to suggest that we don't have talented attorneys in the state of Vermont. It's to acknowledge, as I said earlier, that part of leadership is acknowledging when you need help uh, and to bring people in to get it right the first time because we have to win these cases. I just want to clarify too that this is a very contractual and this isn't, uh, it's about giving equal time to TJ Jeff Donovan and also we're going to give equal time to um, uh, Bill Sorrell, the Attorney General. So I don't want you to think this is a campaign uh, show for just one. And you're going to have a debate tomorrow night, which is yes. still yeah. up at the T, I believe. So um, is there anything you'd like to, if Mr. Sorrell was here, what would you like to ask Mr. Sorrell? And I'll ask him the same question Friday night. Uh, is there anything, you know, what, what's, the, con what's the, the difference between the two of these things, the paramount difference? Sure. I think the paramount difference is on the issue of criminal justice. And the question I've asked uh, Mr. Sorrell and that you should ask Mr. Sorrell is name the initiatives that you've put in place in this state over the last 15 years uh, that have addressed the issues of recidivism, that have addressed the issues of substance abuse, that have addressed the issues of mental illness that drives our corrections budget. Well, that's, again, what I went back to. I was kind of disappointed um, with the soda pop thing. I just thought of all the things that you could do with the Attorney General. Why would you concentrate your time on that? Uh, Dick, is there anything else that you wanted to cover? Yeah, I think there's a couple of issues that I'd like to cover. I'd like to uh, go back a little bit. Um, there are a number of issues surrounding the elderly and elder abuse that I think a number of us in the legislature as we get older, and I noticed that Bill Botsov's here from Powell, Representative Bill Botsov, Representative Alice Miller, Representative Mary Morrissey from Bennington are all here tonight uh, to listen to, to this debate. But the one, one thing that all of us know down here is this is one of the largest populations of aging folks in the state. Bennington County has a lot of older folks. And I personally am concerned about how I, I uh, uh, have received complaints.
complaints from individuals who are concerned about it. So I'm really interested in TJ's approach here on a unit uh, and how he would approach this, what I think is a huge problem in the state. Thank you. Uh, my vision of an elder abuse unit stems from BSIUs. Uh, you have a multidisciplinary team to address an issue. It's not just law enforcement. I think 21st century law enforcement is acknowledging that you can't arrest your way out of problems. It has to be education. It has to be awareness. It has to be information. It has to be treatment where appropriate. So in terms of uh, elder abuse, I go back to what you said, Senator, about the issue of sex abuse. For many years, the issue of sexual violence went under-reported or unreported, very high percentage. When you raise awareness, when you have these specialized units, you do a couple things. Number one, you develop an expertise. You bring in a multidisciplinary team of experts to work on a particular case. So you're looking at this crime from all different uh, uh, vantage points. In terms of elder abuse, it's not only enforcement, adult protection services, victim advocacy, banking. Uh, you all, what you also do is you raise awareness by community outreach. You educate people, you give them the opportunity, the confidence to report these crimes. That's what happened in this state uh, to many uh, uh, folks in terms of, you, as you said, in terms of sexual violence. But we have seen, um, Vermont's gonna have done a very good job on the issue of sexual violence, uh, in my opinion. And we have seen more cases, but public awareness is good. You want people reporting crimes. So on the issue of elder abuse, it's the same model. It's creating a multidisciplinary team embedded in the Attorney General's office, creating those partnerships across state agencies, whether it's, as I said, adult protection services, it's people from uh, what was formerly called Bishka. What, what is Bishka called now? Uh, banking. Finance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people from banking, people from uh, the victim advocacy, people from uh, the liaisons to the senior centers across the state, going out, talking to people holding public forums about these issues, what you can do to protect yourself. That is the best form of public safety, is giving people the information and the tools they need in order to protect themselves, in order to truly enjoy their best years. Modeled exactly after the SIUs. Thank you. Um, one other issue that I'd like to, I'm not sure that it's hit as squarely down here in Bennington County as it has in some parts of the state, but there's a lot of controversy about the use of tasers, rather, and I know that you in Chittenden County uh, have all kinds of things available that not every county has, I guess. But you, uh, there was a person, I think it was in Thetford, who was killed by a state police officer uh, who in the line of duty used a taser on this individual. Uh, do you have any thoughts on none of that particular case, but on the use of tasers? I, I do. Distinction between my opponent and I. Number one, I think that local communities should decide if their local police departments use tasers. We should have local control on this issue. Secondly, if local communities do decide that they use tasers, then they have to follow and adopt a statewide policy. As Attorney General, this is what I want to do. Number one, that policy has to bring in a few of the stakeholders. ACLU has to have a seat at the table. League of Cities and Towns has a, seat at, have to, has a seat at the table. Three, law enforcement has to. But most importantly, mental health professionals have to have a seat at the table. And we have to develop the best education and training for our law enforcement so they can identify, detect, and most importantly, de-escalate people who are suffering from mental illness so we avoid tragedies. Burlington has a good policy that I'd like to encourage more communities to adopt. Many of the calls to the police in this state are not calls to report crime. Uh, there are calls to report different calls for service. Many of those calls are mental health calls. Uh, Burlington has a street outreach worker who's a mental health counselor ride with the police. So when they go out to the 911 calls, if it's somebody who's suffering from uh, mental health issues, it's not the police officer who tries to intervene and solve whatever the issue is. Because under our system, what happens in many places in the state is an arrest is made, that person is brought in to court, and 
And again, you have the cycle of our criminal justice system, system with recidivism, with mental health. By having outreach workers, or engaging in prevention, or working in the community-based way, you're lowering the cost, not only the financial cost, but the personal cost to the individual by doing it in a therapeutic way that makes sense not only for this community in terms of public safety, but also makes sense in terms of respecting people's rights. This is something that the Attorney General, as a Chief Law Enforcement Officer, can lean on. These are the best practices that are happening in different parts of the state. It's not just Chittenden County, it's all over the state. But we really should develop best practices. As I go back to this point, the Attorney General is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer. Bring people together. As I said, I have the backing of the state police. I have the respect of my fellow state's attorneys. Let's bring together, let's develop best practices not only on the issues of mental illness, but alternative forms and systems of justice. And let's implement them across the state so there's a level playing field for all Vermonters. It's gonna work for our public safety, and it's gonna work for our budget. Sorry. I like uh, what you said about Taze, but I think each community should have a vote on it if they want it or they don't want it. I, uh, I, I question whether we should really have it, but um, especially in what happened yeah. in the case you just mentioned. Um, we're gonna open this up to the audience in a few minutes, then we come back. Why don't we do that? If anybody sure. in the audience would like to have a question or something, uh, raise your hand. Sure, shout it out to DJ Um, I just want to say congratulations. You had the absolute right answer to, to the question about tasing and talking about Matt, Lump, Matt Young and the intervention in, in Burlington. And we can save a fortune. If, if police officers get CIT training, they know what to do, how to do. You get teams going out, you get mental health professionals, maybe some emergency people, and maybe a police officer not in uniform, and do that intervention. You're going to save money, you're going to save lives, and it's the right thing to do. So you have the absolute right answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, I feel very strongly about this. I mean, and Senator Sears can attest to this. There are a lot of creative people in this business who are working together. And I think part of this acknowledgement of saying, you know, have, we should have new ideas, we should look at things differently and be more creative, is this. I mean partners in criminal justice, teachers, counselors, healthcare workers, mental health professionals, social service workers, because our mission statements may be different, but our end goal is the same. It is a safe and vibrant community for everybody. And that rapid intervention program it truly, I think, uh, symbolizes that, because we are all on a level playing field. It's not the prosecutor and the police detached from the community members. It's everybody together, working together to solve these issues in public safety. One more question. Can you dream about having a mental health court available all around the state? Yes, I mean, I, Senator Sears and I have talked about this. I raise this everywhere or when I go in the, go in the state. Uh, why does Chittenden County only have the, the mental health court and the drug court? These issues do not discriminate. They are all over this state. And the Attorney General is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of this state. It is, a tr it is truly about leadership. And you cannot abdicate your responsibility from these issues when you're the chief law enforcement officer. Um, we don't agree on, uh, we agree almost 90% of the time. Uh, this is one of those cases where I do agree with TJ, but I want to caution that it takes the support of the state's attorney in the particular county in order to have any particular court. So, for example, Bennington is the only county that I'm aware of that has a domestic violence court. And by all accounts, it does fairly well. But nobody else, no other state's attorney, has taken the lead on that. TJ, as a state's attorney, has taken the lead on the drug courts, the mental health court, and even a veterans court, I believe, if you have in Chittenden County. Of course, they have a lot more people going through their court system. Um, but it, it does take the cooperation of the individual state's attorney, which I, I, you alluded to in talking about equal justice, no. but that is one of the problems. There's another lady over here that had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, my concern is 
how it's actually going to work. I like your idea. Yeah. I, I can see absolutely how clear it is and precise. But from my own experience, there's barriers to this. And the barriers tend to be the individual agencies and their mission statements <laughs> and priorities. Sure. And they'll say, oh, that's a great idea, but that's not our priority. And there yeah. goes your um, interagency working. And then that barrier has to be overcome. Ring fencing, funding, yeah. so that it doesn't disappear. Sure. That's what you're trying to do. Because it's huge issues. Very, you're absolutely right. And, and that was our experience in Chittenden County. How did we overcome it? By going out, getting out of our office, getting out of our silos, talking to folks, explaining to them the mutual goal and benefit of working together, of sharing information. It, listen, this did not happen overnight. It took work. Uh, but this is what we're rich in in Vermont, people who care. And we do get into our little silos and turf battles, absolutely, we dealt with them. But I'll tell you, the success we've had with our partners, now more partners want to get involved. And it, you know, you, you have to do the legwork up front and you have to be willing uh, to get out there, uh, pound the pavement, and go talk to really people who people in public safety never thought they would talk about. I have a partnership uh, with, uh, the head of psychiatry at UVM Medical School uh, working with veterans. Uh, these are the collaborations that we're working on because we're seeing the populations are overlapping through in our different systems. So it's looking at it uh, from a vision of saying, where can we partner, where can we collaborate, where can we save money, and where can we really have meaningful interventions earlier in time? Because if it gets to us in, in the court system, oftentimes it's too late. I think there's a even the town down here can't cooperate. <laughs> but you know, this is going back to Senator Sears' point about why we need the legislature. We need the legislature for funding. Of course we do. Yeah. But Senator Sears made reference to this earlier. It is about this justice reinvestment money. And the money that we were appropriated was about $100,000. I can tell you, we've saved more than that uh, by the number of people we've diverted. And so I think how we get people on board, and we're working with uh, Max Schluter, and I always get this wrong from the uh, Vermont Center for Criminal, Inf uh, Criminal Justice Information. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, he's doing an outcome study on our program. And we're looking at recidiv recidivism rates, and we're looking at savings. And I think once we show well, we're going to a much lower recidivism rate and a lot of savings, people are going to get on board because this is the wave of the future. And when I look at the criminal justice system, with that court system being the last, it's really that exit ramp on that highway of how many exit ramps do we have in terms of alternatives, community-based programs, before we have to get to the court system and truly make that court system meaningful, with teeth, so we're putting people in jail who we're afraid of, not who we're mad at. Thank you. Do, you. do you have a personal opinion, this is, a, this is not, not a curveball question, but do you have a personal opinion for this state on legalizing marijuana? Yes. I don't support legalization of marijuana. I support decriminalization of small amounts of marijuana. Here's why. Decriminalization of marijuana for me, I'm concerned about the message. I say that right out front. What I'm more concerned about is the issue of collateral consequences as a result of a conviction for small amounts of marijuana. Uh, this gets to equal justice again. In my opinion, no young person who is convicted, this is not about going to jail, this is the act of a conviction, who is convicted for a small amount, possessing a small amount of marijuana, should never lose their eligibility for federal student loans. That is a collateral consequence of a marijuana conviction. Also, public housing, also, food stamps, but the real issue is that fed, the eligibility of federal student loans. Who can afford to go to college? I think through decriminalization, you can create a process through civil tickets, you get tickets of education, of counseling, so you hold people accountable, but you allow them to retain their eligibility to go on to school if they so choose. I mean, because you, I know we've had this debate in, in this state for years, but you 
also have to get into, you have to look at the issue of resources. Again, take those kids, that kid from Wyndham County, uh, who comes from a family of resources, and the kid from Rutland County who's going to walk into court by himself. Both are charged with a misdemeanor amount of small marijuana. Very likely, the kid with resources who's got a private lawyer may get the better deal, may be sent to diversion and walk out of court, no problems asked. Life goes on. The kid who doesn't have the money to pay for a private attorney wants to re represent himself and it's just a small amount of marijuana will walk into court, thinks he's going to plead guilty, pay a $100 fine, lock out, lock out the courthouse doors. Case over. Well, here's the difference. That $100 fine is a conviction. As a result of that conviction, he will no longer be eligible for federal student loans. That, this happens in our state. This is an issue of fairness. It's an issue of justice. It's an issue that should be addressed. You know, Senator Sears has uh, spoken out on this issue. And this, this really is an issue of leveling the playing field. And it goes back to my point that, you, in my opinion, you can no longer not talk about the issue of poverty when you talk about the issue of criminal justice. I, I said we didn't agree on that. <laughs> um, but we do agree that nobody should go to jail for yes. possession of small amounts. Yeah. I think we all agree on that. And yet, uh, two years ago, we used 480 bed days for people who were possessing under an ounce of marijuana in the state. And that was their only, that was the only crime. Uh, so it, it does happen. Um, but I do want to su suggest that one of the things that, luckily, some of these controversial issues will get taken up by the House first. And uh, we're hopeful that uh, all things being equal, the House will take the first crack at this issue. But I want to mention that Connecticut recently passed a law um, that basically decriminalized the possession of a half an ounce or less. And there will be a lot of information available to Vermonters from that law and from the folks who wrote it. Um, and, uh, Luckily, a friend of mine from the Justice Center, who's now a special assistant on, on things like to the governor of Connecticut, Mike Waller, was intricately involved in it. We're going to call on people like Mike Waller. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. But there may be a slight difference yeah. there, but... Um, Maybe both of these can clarify something for me. If yeah. you said, and what you said, can we do something with our legislature in this state that would be criminalized or lessen it so that they can get federal? College loans or not, that's something we can't really tackle. Can we? No. That's it, a federal it, law. That it, it's that act. It, it, it is. It is the. It is the conviction, which jeopardizes the eligibility of the federal benefit. So, say a 17, 18 year old kid or less gets a conviction of a small amount of marijuana. Mm -hmm. Does like you say. Doesn't have the rich parent to help get him off. But that means that even in the state, no matter what we do. They can't still get federal. Ineligible for federal student loans. I a drug, I a drug, a drug conviction renders you ineligible for federal student loans. Well, that's something we got to take up with uh, Walsh and Leahy and uh, Sanders. Okay. One of the complications here is if you're under 21, yeah. the consequences um, of, of alcohol possession as well as the small amount of drugs. Uh, they need to be equal. I think. You don't want a situation where you get a civil ticket for the possession of, a, of a, one joint of marijuana, for example, and you get a criminal conviction for the possession of a case of beer. So those are things that, you know, getting into the minutiae here, but that's what legislatures deal with, and that's where we can use some advice from the AG. Yeah, right, I agree. Um, is there anybody else? Any other questions, Carl? Oh, come on, come on. That's why I asked you to come tonight, Tom. <laughs> Anybody else? Bill, oh, there you go, right here, right in the front. Yeah. Then, then you won't search. I still am unclear in the whole question of limits in finance. Yeah. Because, for example, you putting it very simple. If an individual or a corporation wants to give quite a lot of money or a limited amount of money to a company in their loan, are they allowed to do so, both the individual and all the corporation? Currently, yes. Could yes. you repeat that? Yeah, repeat the question from here. The question was this, and correct me if I did not hear it correctly. Can a corporate
corporation in Vermont now gives um, a, a super PAC an unlimited amount of money. Did I hear that correctly? A corporation or an individual either one. Can give a super PAC, a super PAC being one of these, and it has to be an independent, there can be no coordination <coughs> between what's called a super PAC and the candidate. I think Senator Sears raised the issue. We have limits for candidates in this state. There's question as to those, but the issue as to can a corporation or an individual give what we're calling now super PACs a limited amount of money without disclosing where that money is coming from? Yes. And that is that is a result of the Citizens United decision from the United States Supreme Court. Going on that, isn't it kind of a, I mean, it's ironic to me, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, I don't think anybody likes that about what PACs can now do to influence an election. There's only a few people here, but do you do you all agree with that? That do you think these super PACs are kind of crazy the way that they can give money out? Just raise your hand if you think it's a stupid ruling. I'm curious. Yeah. You know, it's look at the uh, look at the presidential race. Right. Uh, you've got people uh, sending millions of dollars, uh, tens of millions of dollars, one individual uh, to super PACs that arguably does not coordinate with any campaign or candidate, uh, but can now do these independent or expenditures, uh, and you, you, you see the commercials on TV. Alice, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, oh, I'm, question. This is just general, but I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. <clears throat> I'm not sure whether this question is within your remit. No. I'm not sure I have all your, all your uh, responsibilities could be. But if we take um, the worst case scenario of having Romney elected president along with the Republican House and Senate, they repeal Obamacare, what would be the position of the Vermont single payer initiative? What do you want to send our serious? Uh, that's what, one of the reasons he said we need to consult to make sure it's constitutional, whatever we write. The problem for Vermont, if that happened, would be the waivers where we would get the federal money to help us pay for the programs. Without the federal money uh, to pay to expand Medicare or Medicaid, uh, Medicaid programs, we wouldn't have the money to even begin to do the health care reform that we want to do. In 2017, if it's and there's a lot of steps that need to go along, but again, as we approach this problem uh, of healthcare, providing healthcare for everyone in Vermont, we're going to have to work side by side with the AG's office and with others to make sure that whatever we're doing is going to stand the tests or do the best we can to make sure they do. And one of the questions we always ask in judiciary. Is it going to be found constitutional? There are times, you know, I can't walk to the Supreme Court and say, is this going to be constitutional or not? But we do try to get the best guess we can. And one of the, I think that when we were doing a, day, a DNA bill on uh, providing DNA on people who were arrested in order to, um, to make sure we get the right person and all those other reasons, we recognize that there might be some problems with that. But we used our legislative counsel for best advice. We used a lot of good advice. But we don't know if that's constitutional or not. It's going to be, it is being challenged right now. And we'll see what the courts decide. But when you write a law that you're pushing the envelope too far, if somebody has to say, wait a minute, these would be the consequences if you go too far. And that I see as part of the Attorney General's role, which we haven't had. Uh, by and large. Does that help answer the question, I hope? Yes, yeah, It's all about the money. <laughs> My turn? No. Uh, I've been on the Appropriations Committee in the House of Representatives for six years. Year after year after year, I see nothing but increases in the prison <coughs> corrections budget. We cut money from children and families, we cut money from the seniors, from the disabled, from our most vulnerable Vermonters, so we can't cut money from our prison system. 
I hear tonight you say that I thought the cost of incarcerating a person was $45,000 a year. Now again, you say it's $52,000. It's unsustainable. I'm so pleased to hear your ideas for prison reform and for justice reinvestment. I would like to tell you that I have seen time and time again data that has come into us from the Commission of Corrections, from the Defendant General, showing that there is more incarceration for nonviolent crimes in southern Vermont than in other parts of the state, including your county, Chittenden County, by population. Are there any standards for why people are imprisoned, or is it just do as you will? Well, I think it gets back to the, uh, the, the equal justice question of 14 different criminal justice systems and 14 different counties. And I truly think what's missing is an engaged attorney general willing to work with the state's attorneys, willing to collaborate, willing to demonstrate what best practices look like, willing to deploy some resources from the attorney general's office to the local state's attorney's office. The attorney general is the largest law firm in the state of Vermont. They got the resources. Uh, and working with local state's attorneys, local, local police departments on the issues of mental illness, state's attorneys on the issues of alternative uh, justice systems, to truly create those best practices and draw down that corrections budget. You know, this past year, I think because of the leadership of Governor Shumlin, Senator Sears, Representative Lipper, the budget for corrections for the first time in a long time is actually level funded. Uh, that's great news. Uh, still more work to be done. I mean, in the stat that I look at, two stats, a day in jail, depending on the facility in the state, $150, $175 a day. A day in treatment, residential treatment, $95 a day. This is about bringing the credibility gravitas of the chief law enforcement officer, the attorney general, to bear, to lobby, to say, this is public safety, this is smart on crime, invest in treatment. And that's what I'm willing to do because that's where we're going to see that justice reinvestment money go. This is not to suggest we need new taxes to pay for this. This is truly creating different priorities that are going to enhance our public safety. Let me just put in a plug, we'll get that last question, but let me put in a plug for justice reinvestment and what it's done. And this is not um, something that Vermont invented. Uh, states like Texas, states like Kansas <coughs> have all taken advantage of this because they knew they can't build their way out of this problem. The reason there's confusion about what it costs per year in, in prison is Vermont has a number of small jails and prisons. So each one is a little bit different. And the average in-state cost is around 52,000. But we send about 500 people out of state. And the cost out of state is around 27,000. So when you're looking at what's it cost and you get confused with that, it's because the out of state. Now, if we can reduce 100 beds that we use, the savings is 100 times that 25 or $27,000 immediately off the top, and that's what's got re gotten reinvested over the years, uh, the last several years. But it, what we've seen is this, from the prescription drug problem and the opiate problem, is a tremendous spike in the number of people on detention. Last year, when you and I worked on our appropriations bills and the bill voted for it, we budgeted 300 people on detention. Last week, I got a report from the Commissioner of Corrections, it's 450 people. 450 people in jail on detention. That means they haven't been convicted of a crime. They're just there waiting. And that's part of our problem. So just so it's clear to everybody, I know you have a question. Yeah, you know, with Gabby Giffords and Trayvon.